Welcome everyone. It's so wonderful to see some familiar faces um, out there. Um, I was looking over the Facebook uh, post there and uh, heard a lot of wonderful comments. It's a crazy time out there. Um, I'm a hugger. I'm a, I'm a crier. Um, social contracts right now aren't so big on uh, hugging, but uh, get a little misty eyed. Um, also had a chance to go through all of these photos um, that were on my computer about Glacier Bay National Park and um, also got misty eyed. I'm really missing that place. And um, so uh, I'm really looking forward to, to, to talking about it with you, to showing some, uh, some photos that have taken over the years and, uh, and just uh, introducing or reintroducing you to um, a place that I love. So um, I'm going to start here. I'm going to um, share uh, again. My name is Jeremy Sines. I'm um, an expedition leader, I'm an expedition guide uh, for Uncruise Adventures. And uh, I've been working uh, in for summers in Glacier Bay National Park for, oh my gosh, I want to say the word, it's uh, over 20 years now. And um, why uh, it's a, a wonderful, wonderful place to, to be and a wonderful, wonderful place to visit. And uh, so um, let's go there. What do you say? All right, I'm going to start sharing here. Um, I'll, I'll, as we go through this, uh, this talk, um, uh, there'll be a couple of times in which um, I'll have a slide for uh, questions. So uh, that would be the time to do so. Um, I think if you have a uh, chat at the very bottom of your screen, um, if you'd like to, to type in um, a, a question, uh, then uh, Liz, who's our, our moderator, uh, will uh, let me know um, that the question is there and she'll either uh, pick, on, uh, pick you to ask your question or she'll read out that question. So um, we'll, uh, we'll see how this goes. All right, everyone ready? Okay. All right. Well, uh, first of all, um, 20 years ago, I fell in love with a place. Um, I've done this before. Um, Jackson Hole, the Grand Teton National Park, probably my first wilderness love. Point Reyes a little bit later on, I saw my first gray whale there and totally fell in love uh, with those places, uh, both of them near and dear to my heart. Uh, but uh, 20 years ago, I came up to Glacier Bay National Park to visit my dad, and I realized that I had found my true love, a place that actually brought both of these places, uh, uh, the mountains of Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and the the rich marine life of Point Reyes um, brought them both together and uh, I fell in love my very first trip um, up bay um, as they call it. I began exploring uh, this place with my dad on kayaking trips uh, as well. Uh, eventually became a guide, quit my day job uh, to come up to Glacier Bay National Park and show people around. Uh, it was really a watershed moment in my life um, and uh, a moment of great change um, as well. As I was going through all of these photos, I realized that um, I was basically uh, reflecting on what I had seen and done uh, up there for the last 20 years. So uh, we're calling this uh, Glacier Bay National Park uh, Reflections. Uh, we're also gonna talk a lot about change. That seems to be a big word these days and uh, one we're all talking about and Glacier Bay is really um, all about change. I fell in love with several different aspects of Glacier Bay National Park. Um, the wilderness, the mountain scenery. I fell in love with the terrestrial wildlife that is pretty abundant. Uh, the marine uh, megafauna that you can find uh, are all around the area. Uh, the verdant rainforest uh, dripping uh, with moss. But when it really comes down to it, uh, Glacier Bay National Park is all about glaciers. First and foremost, um, it is really about tidewater glaciers. Um, in 1923, um, William uh, S. Cooper, um, an eco ecologist, um, lobbied uh, the Ecological Society of America uh, to make uh, this area a national monument. Um, about uh, a couple of years later, 1925, Calvin, Calvin Coolidge made it a national monument. Eventually, um, it became a national park. 1986 became a, a biosphere reserve. 1992 World Heritage Site, uh, joining three other national uh, parks and provincial parks, two in Canada, the Kulani National uh, Provincial Park, I should say, uh, Tapanchini Provincial Park, and uh, America's largest national park, Wrangell St. Elias. 
uh, that whole area makes up one of the largest internationally protected areas uh, in the planet. Glacier Bay National Park is 3.2 million acres of uh, incredible, mostly wilderness, very few areas uh, where you can uh, build a trail, uh, where you can have a lodge, where you can have a road. For the most part, um, it is an uh, area left untrammeled for people to visit um, and to leave and for the wildlife, uh, wild plants uh, to, to go about uh, and do their thing. Uh, William S. Cooper um, asked the Ecological Society to uh, lobby Calvin Coolidge to make this a national monument uh, because A, he could do it by uh, presidential proclamation, uh, but he also gave five criteria for why this area should become a national monument. The first one is Tidewater Glaciers. Uh, we'll talk about those. Um, we'll uh, talk about accessibility to these Tidewater Glaciers as well. Uh, for folks that have visited here, you know that uh, this is a pretty special part uh, to, um, to uh, Glacier Bay National Park. Um, ancient coastal rainforests, these areas that weren't touched uh, by the uh, glaciers uh, where big old growth forests still reign. Um, a, uh, a pretty vibrant human history uh, here as well. Um, and also that Glacier Bay National Park is a living laboratory. Um, it is not just a place to visit uh, and to uh, experience, but also a place that we are able uh, to study. So we're gonna look at Glacier Bay National Park through the lens of uh, these five criteria that William, um, Scooper, uh, William S. Cooper um, lobbied the Ecological Society of America um, to uh, preserve. But let's start with Tidewater Glaciers. Um, most of these photos I've taken myself. This is actually a photo uh, from the Gustavus Dock. And uh, um, I used to head out here with my dad um, just about every night that we could, that it wasn't raining, um, to watch the sunset. So we are looking at the Fairweather Range. We're looking west um, over a flat area, um, over the mouth of Glacier Bay National Park, um, to mountains that rise 9, 8, 10, uh, 12, 15,000 feet. Um, on the far right is uh, Mount Fairweather. Uh, we're going to switch views now. We're going to look from east uh, to west, uh, looking at the coastal mountain range because the Fairweathers are one of the tallest coastal mountain ranges um, in the world. And so that is the ocean that you see right in front of you, uh, the Gulf of Alaska. To make a tidewater glacier, to make any glacier, uh, you need a couple of things. Uh, one, you need some pretty cold temperatures and uh, cold temperatures that last uh, for a decent chunk of the year. Uh, you also need copious amounts of precipitation, um, places where that precipitation um, comes in not just rain, uh, but in the form of snow. Glacier Bay National Park is a glacial nursery. Uh, the Gulf of Alaska spawning um, incredibly moisture laden storms uh, coming uh, into uh, the coastline here, um, smacking right into the fair weather range. Um, 15,000 feet uh, as these uh, air moves up in elevation, the temperature drops. And even in the summertime, uh, when the temperatures are the warmest, um, this pre precipitation uh, will fall as snow. Now glaciers form uh, when more snow falls and more snow accumulates every year, uh, especially during the winter, uh, then um, then melts uh, during the summertime. Uh, so at higher elevations, uh, in some places in Glacier Bay National Park, um, it snows almost year round. Well, some of this might melt, but most of it doesn't. And each year, uh, layer after layer of snow begins to build up. And this beautiful snowflake that you see on your left uh, will begin to change under the pressure and the weight of all of the snow above it. Um, you can see that uh, with, uh, with weight, uh, with pressure, that the air is squeezed out of those little snowflakes out there. Um, well, eventually, um, there's less than 20% of air. Um, freshly fallen snow um, uh, weighs uh, about uh, six feet uh, per cubic foot. Uh, but once it goes through this process, uh, year after year, um, this, uh, air is pushed out to become extremely dense, um, and it can weigh up to 50 pounds. Uh, per cubic foot. So an incredible amount of, uh, of air lost, uh, but um, ice is gained, so is weight gain. And because most of this snow is accumulating up high um, in the mountains, uh, very, very steep slopes, um, gravity uh, begins to pull uh, the glacier uh, downhill. And it begins to flow uh, like a river. Uh, this is a Skidmore Glacier, and, and uh, this glacier flowing off of the high mountain peak of Glacier Bay in the Fairweather Range. Most glaciers in the, in the world um, are um, 
going to make it down to a low-lying valley. Uh, once they get low enough in elevation, the temperatures become warmer, and you can see that on this uh, photo as you go to the bottom of the screen. Uh, there's less of that bright white snow up high, more of that bright white snow. Um, as the glacier flows down the hill, uh, most of this begins to melt. If you're really lucky and you go to a place like Glacier Bay National Park, they're so close, uh, the mountains are so close that spawn these glaciers so close to the tide uh, that these glaciers will actually flow down and touch tidewater, water that's affected by the tide, basically marine water, seawater. And turn the, the, the now, volume. The life of a, um, of a tidewater glacier is actually a little bit more different than that of a valley glacier. And, uh, that's because not only does it lose elevation, and temperatures begin to rise, uh, but it's also touching uh, uh, water, with you uh, water you that is actually quite cold, uh, but it's still much warmer than the ice that's actually touching. I need to get bungee cords. Uh, here is a, a record of, of a glacier. Uh, you can see the water line there to the right. I don't know how. Um, above it, uh, you have the ice uh, that's flowing down uh, from the mountain below it. Um, have the terminus of the glacier. Um, as glaciers flow downhill, uh, just like rivers, they pick up rocks and they transport them. They're big conveyor belts. Uh, this big glacier um, can, uh, picks up rock and drags it all the way down to its, uh, its snout, to its terminus, and it drops um, it off right in front. Now, tidewater glaciers, if they're successful, if they're moving, if they're gaining enough snow, uh, they're dropping off all of this material in front. It actually builds a big buffer zone uh, this shoal and moraine uh, builds a big buffer zone between the face of the glacier um, and the water line. If uh, it's able to do that, then a tidewater glacier has more of a chance of advancing, of actually pushing that moraine in front of it, um, and, uh, and less of a chance of just actually uh, falling apart. We'll see how that in just a minute. I'm going to see in this uh, diagram here that uh, up top, um, you can see where a glacier, uh, the ELA is basically the ablation zone above that line. Um, right next to the uh, A there is where uh, more snow accumulates and melts every year. And below that line is where more snow melts every year uh, than accumulates. So if a glacier is flowing down, it's touching the tidewater. Um, we move now to B um, and it's bringing all of that um, marine material down and dropping it off in front of it as it builds up uh, um, this uh, basically a sweater, a buffer zone in front of it, protecting it uh, from uh, the ice, uh, then it can continue to advance. So it needs that terminal moraine, but it also needs a tremendous amount of precipitation falling um, as snow. Well, let's say um, in C that our glacier is moving uh, down the valley um, and it has this uh, buffer right in front of it, uh, but then things change, climate changes, uh, temperatures become warmer, maybe net less snow falls over a, um, a pretty long period of time. And because of that less, ice is flowing uh, down uh, the hill, um, then uh, eventually um, with glaciers calving off, uh, icebergs uh, calving off in front of the glacier, um, the glacier begins to retreat and the water spills over the front of the moraine and is touching the full face of uh, the glacier. And then that glacier has a tough time moving forward. Matter of fact, uh, glaciers generally uh, tend to recede quite a bit uh, once this happens. So there's a great shot of a big chunk of ice uh, falling off the face of a glacier. Uh, just because ice is falling off the face of a tidewater glacier doesn't mean that it's receding or moving um, or uh, losing ground. Um, it just means that uh, this uh, tidewater, even though it's maybe 40 uh, or 39 degrees, still warmer than the ice, it's melting, undercutting it. Um, and this is why many people come to Glacier Bay to see uh, big chunks of ice uh, calve off uh, into the water. Well, we talked about this uh, because this uh, happened on a very large scale to actually create Glacier Bay National Park. So a uh, little fuzzy on the slide, but uh, you'll kind of get the idea. Um, we're going we're gonna to walk uh, through both the advance and then the retreat of a very large glacier um, that uh, created uh, what we see now as Glacier Bay National Park. Um, right around 1680, uh, no one's exactly sure, but um, uh, right around this time, uh, we know that there was a very, very large valley with a very large glacier at the head of that valley. But uh, at the snout of that glacier, there were some big rivers flowing down, uh, filled with, uh, with salmon, um, some big um, old growth forests, uh, so much so uh, that uh, the native folks uh, who were from the area, the Huna Tlingit, 
um, called this uh, their home. Uh, they set up camp there. This was a, a, a village uh, that um, they used to collect uh, uh, salmon um, and, and forage uh, during uh, the summertime and, and sometimes actually stay there uh, year round. Well, as temperatures began to change, um, as more precipitation began to change, uh, those Tlingit were driven out of this big, huge valley. The glaciers began to advance um, and uh, the ice began to accumulate. And the tongue, the snout, uh, the terminus of this glacier that you can see on the very bottom, um, pushed out through the river valley um, out into what's known as icy straits uh, today. Uh, this is 1750. No one was really around to see this other than the native folks there. They didn't write a whole lot of this down, but um, at the 1794, George Vancouver came into the area. Uh, he was looking for the inside passage, and uh, when he described this area, uh, both um, in words and in map, uh, he uh, noted that there was a bay here, but it was only about five miles deep uh, with a um, several mile long face, several thousand foot um, uh, cliff of ice. Um, spewing out ice into the water. Um, he named that area Icy Straits. Well, from about that moment on, uh, the glaciers uh, began, uh, this large glacier uh, began uh, to recede. Um, 1880, uh, we have another um, account, a uh, European account, a written down account of this area, and uh, it was by John Muir, who came in uh, 1879. Also in 1880, um, he traveled much, much further up uh, Glacier Bay. About uh, 30, uh, 37, uh, 40 miles, he was able to travel up um, to uh, the, the farthest reaches of Glacier Bay at that time, um, ice covering most of the water, a barren landscape uh, of uh, devoid of, uh, of trees, um, of most plants, um, and then uh, later to, uh, to uh, moving back to today, um, the ice has actually receded um, 75 miles up to the farthest reaches um, up uh, into Glacier Bay National Park, um, creating um, an incredibly uh, um, barren landscape in some areas, uh, but the areas that were uh, last underneath the ice, um, things are changing um, as the uh, ice um, left behind uh, barren uh, material. Um, now here comes uh, the vegetation to once again start to reclaim uh, the land and rebuild uh, the forests that are yet to come. So this is what an area looks like after a glacier has retreated. Um, this is uh, an incredible opportunity I had uh, to head up to Riggs Glacier um, and walk around um, after the glacier had receded. You can see very little vegetation at all, um, all uh, rock, um, no soil, uh, rock uh, and dirt. You know, we were able to walk around in this area. At one point, uh, almost uh, all of the places that the glacier covered uh, looked like this after the glacier began to recede. All right, well, uh, I've got a good stopping point here. Uh, does anyone have any questions about tidewater glaciers or uh, um, uh, that I might be able to answer for you? Um, if you do, I think uh, type them in and um, uh, Liz uh, will uh, either uh, unmute you or she'll read off of the, the question that you have. Looks like we don't have any questions right now. All right, that's perfect. Uh, let's move on. By the way, uh, this is a picture of a, a chunk of glacier ice um, and uh, holding it up uh, to the sun. Um, it looks, it's basically a gem, actually more precious than a gem, more precious than a diamond because um, it is uh, ephemeral. It is uh, slowly uh, melting away, um, but just an absolutely beautiful chunk of glacier ice. We did have one question come in from Sean. Um, okay. Are any glaciers advancing? Um, at the moment, well, any glaciers in the park or around the world, most of the glaciers are uh, receding. Uh, in Glacier Bay National Park, um, the last I heard, Johns Hopkins Glacier is uh, one of the few glaciers that are actually um, uh, advancing in Glacier Bay National Park. And most um, glaciers in the park are actually uh, receding. Um, Gosh, uh, when I first came to Glacier Bay, I believe uh, there were eight tidewater glaciers, eight glaciers that came all the way down um, to the ocean um, and, uh, and were affected by the tidewater. Um, I believe now it's a seven and, uh, and many of those are only touched by, the, uh, by marine water at extreme high tides. Um, I've had 
um, the unfortunate uh, opportunity to watch uh, one of my favorite glaciers, Lamb Blue Glacier, uh, go from um, a tidewater glacier uh, to a glacier that is uh, barely touched uh, by uh, tidewater, even at its highest point. And also Reed Glacier um, was one in which we used to be able to kayak up to. Um, and now uh, you can walk pretty much just to the front of it. So most glaciers are um, receding, um, but there are some glaciers that have just incredible location right at the base of Mount Fairweather and some of the southeast are still gaining enough snow uh, that they can actually uh, advance. All right. Ready to move on, Liz? We're ready. Okay. So our second lens that we're going to look through is accessibility to tidewater glaciers. So this is uh, a, um, a shot from the space of uh, Glacier Bay National Park. And uh, first off, we're going to point out uh, on the left-hand side the Brady Ice Field, a huge big basin full of ice uh, right at the base on the uh, eastern uh, side of the Fairweathers. Um, is a big collection uh, basin uh, for, uh, for snow uh, and for ice. Um, and this ice field actually spawns several other glaciers. So um, as the glacier receded, um, it uh, unfortunately um, uh, moved way back into the bed. Fortunately, it created an incredible waterway uh, for us to, to visit um, several uh, other uh, glaciers. And I've named just a couple of these here. You see them popping up around the screen, um, as uh, many of you may have been uh, with us in, uh, with Uncruise to Glacier Bay. Um, and seeing some of these glaciers, uh, Lamplu and Reed Glacier are ones that we often uh, will um, visit. A Marjorie Glacier is a, a staple, it's a beautiful, beautiful glacier right the farthest reaches of north of Glacier Bay National Park. John Hopkins, uh, one of, well the whole place is one of the most beautiful places in the world, but a special spot in my heart for John Hopkins uh, Glacier. Um, Taylor Glacier, if you've ever been with us uh, to George Island and had a chance to look north, um, at Glacier Bay National Park. Uh, you'll have a chance to see that. And Muir Glacier, we talked about John Muir visiting. Uh, this glacier has receded quite a ways um, up and very um, hard to get to, uh, but well worth it um, if you can. Also, uh, the Grand Pacific Glacier. This is the Trunk Glacier. This, uh, all of these other glaciers that I just named, uh, eventually um, uh, when the bay was covered in ice, um, were tributary glaciers, uh, like tributary creeks and streams to a river. Uh, they flowed down and joined the Grand Pacific Glacier um, and brought it all the way out um, to Icy Strait on the bottom right hand part of your screen. Um, it has now receded um, quite a ways. It can barely look like a glacier to you today, um, but it is the granddaddy of them all. Uh, the reason why Glacier Bay um, and the waterways that we can use to access uh, this place exist. So how can you access this place? Uh, well, a lot of you folks have come in uh, by a vessel standing on the bow of a big ship um, a big a cruise ship, or maybe a smaller ship um, uh, like, uh, like one of ours. Um, but you might have also decided uh, that you wanted to throw a bunch of camp camping gear um, and kayak uh, up into these areas. Man, I can tell you there's no better experience no, in life than uh, kayaking on a beautiful sunny day. Um, incredibly quiet, beautiful spot, um, only interrupted by uh, the loud having of glaciers uh, by bird calls um, and uh, by the occasional blow uh, of a whale. Um, an incredible way to explore this area. You bring all your camping gear, um, you can set up um, and in most of the time uh, find yourself uh, surrounded by no one um, but um, engulfed by incredible natural uh, beauty. Uh, raw mountains, um, in incredibly um, calm uh, water for the most part, uh, freshly deglaciated land. Um, all of that greenery that you see there looks pretty green, but if you were to walk around and take a look down, uh, you might find a variety of flowers. Uh, you might find birds nesting here as well. Um, camping here at the face of Johns Hopkins Glacier. I've uh, done it a couple of times, and uh, boy, I could I tell you just about every moment of them. Most of the time, um, you're trying to sleep, and every time you hear a big boom, you stick your head out so you can see if the glacier's calved. Uh, both because you want to see it calve and you also want to make sure that the big wave that it creates isn't going to take away your kayak um, or your paddle, which you have hopefully pulled up above the high tide line. And now there's another way you can um, uh, experience this. It's kind of cheating, but it's a great way to do it.
Well, that's roughing it for sure. That's your own private chef, uh, a nice uh, warm shower. Um, people to take you out and make sure that you're seeing the best of the area, making sure that you're staying safe as well. Shameless plug for Uncruise Adventures. Um, so yeah. Um, very few places uh, on the planet uh, that you can uh, find yourself uh, walking around on a shoreline um, littered with uh, bergy bits uh, calved off from you know, tidewater glaciers uh, all around you. Um, to actually walk uh, right near the face of glaciers like Lamplu glaciers and uh, take a look around at high mountain peaks uh, all around you. Um, very few people um, uh, come and visit these places and opportunities to, to get out and do some kayaking. This is looking north uh, into uh, Grand Pacific and the Tar Inlet, uh, the northernmost reaches of the bay. Uh, to be on a kayak in this area um, is just exhilarating, um, uh, peaceful, uh, no better place on the planet uh, to find yourself uh, floating around on the water um, and exploring under your own power. Uh, finding yourself uh, the opportunities to uh, visit um, a place that is um, both uh, land and ice, uh, water and land, um, coming together um, and uh, watching uh, the Mother Nature's landscaper uh, glaciers uh, do their business. Uh, this place is all about change and glaciers um, are the catalysts for that change. Uh, finding yourself uh, with a group of friends, uh, sometimes a group of strangers that have uh, become friends, uh, but uh, the experience of uh, being out of your comfort zone just a little bit or maybe a lot um, and, uh, and making sure uh, that uh, you're not only experiencing the place uh, with uh, your eyes and nose, um, maybe even finding some berries to, to check out, um, all the while looking out uh, for a wildlife, especially here in uh, Rica. All right, let's look through another lens, uh, ancient coastal rainforest. Um, not all of Glacier Bay was filled with ice, as we uh, saw in that uh, diagram several slides ago. Matter of fact, uh, there was uh, quite a bit of areas that they call an area of refugia, uh, a refuge uh, for the forests. So uh, although uh, a big chunk of Glacier Bay and the valley uh, that once uh, was um, uh, had a, a home to a Tlingit uh, village, um, where those forests were wiped out, um, other places were not. And the forests were allowed to grow for hundreds, if not thousands of years, coastal temperate rainforests. Uh, this is the outer coast of Glacier Bay National Park. Um, and at one point, um, uh, most of this area um, was actually above uh, sea level uh, when most of the uh, ice was tied up um, in, uh, in glaciers. Um, even though we had this little ice age starting around uh, 1860 or uh, earlier, uh, many of the areas uh, down by uh, Brady Glacier and just uh, to the right of it, uh, Dundas Bay, Fern Harbor, Taylor Bay, some places you may have visited with us. If you've been lucky enough uh, to head out to the uh, outer coast and uh, either flown or walked up and down the coastline uh, to see uh, Latuya Bay um, and uh, La Perouse uh, Glacier, um, these areas um, have incredibly old trees, old forests um, that uh, um, is uh, um, a pretty unique uh, to the area, especially uh, to Glacier Bay uh, National Park. Uh, not all of this is incredibly forested, although uh, this picture from Dundas Bay, it certainly is. 
um, scientists are looking at, um, at what is happening out here with these old growth temperate rainforests. Uh, these places have been untrammeled by, uh, by humans other than uh, the Tlingit uh, who have been here. Uh, there has been no clear cut logging, uh, very little uh, molestation by uh, any uh, humans uh, whatsoever. And it's a great place to find out exactly uh, what happens to old growth temperate rainforest. Boy, tremendous amount of rain falling here. Um, uh, uh, sometimes on a daily basis, very little of it um, is evaporating, um, stays in the ground. What happens uh, when a forest is inundated by water? Um, you might have big, huge uh, trees where there's really good drainage for that water to go away. Uh, but then you also might have what's called a muskegs or a blanket bog, a peat bog, uh, where the water has no place to go um, and creates uh, a place uh, that are called uh, muskegs uh, in southeast Alaska, a place where uh, it's easy walking, um, but a place where you feel like you might find um, hobbits and gnomes and, and woodland fairies. It's uh, uh, just a magical, magical place. Um, so um, some of these old growth forests, uh, old forests uh, might not be what you might expect, not big, huge, tall trees, uh, but uh, muskeg, a place uh, where a tremendous amount of vegetation has built up um, and a very, very wet place um, as well. All right, well, uh, we've kind of made it through um, some accessibility and some uh, talk about uh, our ancient uh, rainforest there. Um, nice place to stop again, see if anybody has any questions about, um, about accessibility, maybe uh, some experiences that you've had with us or on your own uh, in, uh, in Glacier Bay and how special it is to be able to access these areas, um, or maybe a little bit about some old growth forests in Glacier Bay. Any questions? I don't see anything right now. Okay. <laughs> if something pops up, I'll let you know. All right, that sounds good. All right, well, let's uh, move on to another couple of, uh, of ways that uh, um, Mr. Cooper um, tried to get uh, this beautiful spot uh, to become uh, protected. Um, vibrant human history. We've talked about this already just a little bit uh, in this talk. Um, that uh, the first inhabitants of Glacier Bay National Park came before it was actually a very large bay. This is just a great um, drawing of what the area may have looked like. We um, uh, don't uh, have any written um, uh, documents of, of this area, but we do have some very rich oral history. Uh, the Tlingit people, uh, Huna Tlingit, uh, were the group of people that called this place home, um, were uh, um, very adept um, at, uh, at, at talking about uh, their history through stories and pass them down from generation to generation. Um, they talked about um, incredibly uh, rich rivers with salmon uh, flowing up into the mountains, a uh, forest on either side, uh, a place uh, that they could gather enough food uh, to make them uh, very comfortable throughout the winter. And they also tell of this glacier that um, was lurking back up into the mountains, uh, eventually moving down the valley about as fast as a dog could run, a galloping glacier uh, that made uh, the Hoonah Tlingit have to leave this area um, in haste, um, throwing all of their gear into uh, uh, canoes um, and, uh, and finding um, areas outside of the influence of the glacier uh, that came down. When I first came uh, to Glacier Bay National Park, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of talk about the native uh, um, presence in this area. Um, although people were there and there were definitely uh, some attempts made uh, to make sure that we knew uh, that this was not just a special place from a natural history standpoint, uh, but also also a spiritual homeland uh, for a group of people that are still around. Uh, these are a couple of cultural tree markings uh, that you can experience walking around uh, right near uh, Uh, certain groups of people um, you recently. You for a minute, Jeremy, so if you could repeat that last part. Um, okay, which, which last part, wait. Just the, the beginning part of that um, okay. section. You froze there for a moment. Okay. Um, yeah, so these are culturally marked trees. If you walk around on some really incredible trails, I got to walk these trails almost daily uh, when I worked for the first four years of, of being here. Um, uh, these culturally marked trees um, uh, were 
not carved uh, by ancient Tlingits, but were um, uh, carved uh, around uh, in the late 80s. Uh, but they wanted, uh, they were there to make sure that we knew uh, that this was not just um, a special place uh, for natural history and for Europeans, but also uh, the spiritual cultural homeland for a group of people called uh, the Huna Tlingit. And uh, these um, markings uh, were carved um, in trees uh, to um, let other folks know uh, that they had made it uh, into an area or that they were using a trail um, that uh, was uh, occupied or are actually uh, owned by the people who lived in the area. Over the years, um, the Huna Tlingit and the National Park Service have come together um, and, uh, and talked about ways in which they could share uh, this area so that not only people from all over the world could come and see the beautiful natural history of the area, um, but also um, experience the spiritual homeland of the Huna Tlingit. And I believe it was three years ago, uh, they built um, a, uh, a long house and I got to watch this uh, online, it was just incredible. Um, a group of folks from the town of Huna, about uh, 25 or 30 miles south, uh, paddled in an open canoe um, into Glacier Bay National Park um, up uh, to this brand new longhouse and uh, an incredible uh, ceremony, um, not only attended uh, by um, local people from the town of Gustavus and from the towns of Huna, uh, but also from uh, um, uh, many folks so pretty high up uh, in the National Park Service. This was a, um, a very unique time and also by people um, all over the world uh, watching it um, uh, online uh, as well. So a very vibrant uh, native uh, presence uh, here in Glacier Bay National Park. Um, it's a great thing to see and if you visit um, make sure you make it to uh, the park headquarters uh, so that you too can experience uh, more than uh, just the natural history but some of the human history. Um, well uh, there are more than uh, just that. Matter of fact uh, Fairweather, Mount Fairweather and the Fairweather Range um, another cast of characters, uh, some explorers, uh, James Cook um, is uh, known uh, to be a, a man who explored uh, the world uh, via ship in 1778. He made it to Alaska and he saw this mountain uh, that he could only get glimpses of and he only saw it, you guessed it, uh, when the clouds were gone during fair weather. He is credited with naming uh, Mount Fairweather uh, and the Fairweather Range. Other uh, world explorers, 1786, um, boy, I get this name wrong all the time. We're going to call him Jean Comte de La Perouse, uh, Jean Francois de Galoup. Boy, I, I'm going to mess that one up. Uh, La Perouse, though, very famous uh, a name that you will find all over uh, the world. Um, he explored the outer coast, so was the first one to actually come uh, ashore, the first European uh, to, to come ashore that we know of in places like uh, Latuya Bay. Uh, this is uh, Mount La Perouse on the southern end of the Fairweather Range um, there. So uh, his uh, presence um, uh, is still around as far as uh, his, his, uh, his name is concerned. Um, also George Vancouver, and you may have heard of this gentleman, an English um, explorer uh, sailing for the British um, 1794. He actually came uh, looking for the inside passage. Uh, these folks weren't just exploring, uh, they had to pay the bills. And so uh, they were looking for a way to connect a waterway to connect the east coast and the west coast uh, for goods uh, and services trade. Uh, George Vancouver came in uh, to Icy Straits. He actually named Icy Straits and we talked a little bit earlier. Uh, you can see uh, on the right hand side here uh, that uh, at the time that he came his map showed about a five mile indentation um, into Glacier Bay. Um, he is responsible for uh, uh, names like Icy Strait and for Point Adolphus, two places that um, are, are very well known uh, to people who have visited uh, the area. Uh, probably the name that you've probably heard the most is, um, is John Muir. Um, by the way, happy belated birthday, uh, John Muir, and uh, Earth Day as well. Um, I grew up in California, um, many other places as well, and I knew John Muir from Yosemite National Park. Um, it wasn't until I came to Alaska that I found out that John Muir had a very big presence here as well. Um, he made a couple of brief visits and uh, brief, brief but meaningful meaningful visits in uh, um, seven, uh, 1889 and 18, uh, sorry, 1879 and 1880. Uh, both times uh, he would write uh, letters and return them back um, to the San Francisco Bulletin, I believe. Um, and many folks um, from San Francisco would read about his adventures in this um, glacier covered um, uh, beautiful uh, wilderness landscape and actually began 
of the first tourism uh, coming up in mail boats and steamships uh, would come up and visit uh, the glaciers here. Uh, John Muir in uh, 1879 came in October in an open uh, boat paddled by uh, Stikine, a nobleman from uh, the area near Wrangell. Um, spent just a couple of days here in the area, um, but enough uh, that his whistle was uh, wet enough. He wanted to return again, came back again uh, the next year, um, visited uh, many different areas, uh, came across uh, many different native uh, groups, uh, 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 peoples that lived here in Glacier Bay as well. Came back uh, after a, a hiatus, a hiatus uh, to about uh, 1889, and uh, this is when things begin to change a little bit for Glacier Bay. Uh, because uh, it goes from being an area where people would write about and describe about, and it kind of moves into um, a time in which uh, Glacier Bay is uh, attempted to be explained. Um, how are glaciers formed? How do glaciers um, carve uh, the landscape? Uh, the fact that this was anything but um, something uh, uh, that uh, was uh, in the province of, uh, of uh, religion um, and uh, was something um, that uh, John Muir had taken a look at from a very different standpoint, that glaciers had carved most of the area. By coming up to Glacier Bay National Park, um, he was able to, um, in his mind anyway, um, prove the fact that um, the big, huge U-shaped valleys um, of Yosemite National Park were indeed created uh, by glaciers because in Glacier Bay National Park, those glaciers were still doing just that. Uh, carving big U-shaped valleys um, into the landscape, uh, receding um, and uh, letting uh, him and uh, many other um, scientists, uh, um, glaciologists, well, mostly geologists, uh, glaciology was pretty new at that moment. Um, he spent a, a summer uh, camped at the very uh, bottom. You can see where uh, these two gentlemen here on the right down below, a nice uh, camp and also a place uh, where tourists uh, would come. Kind of odd that John Muir's uh, writings would bring tourists here. He wasn't the biggest fan uh, of them. Uh, but um, today uh, we look at him as being uh, not only um, uh, the founder of the Sierra Club, uh, but um, uh, the father of uh, 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 national parks or the idea of national parks and very instrumental and integral in um, us preserving areas like Glacier Bay National Park and Yosemite. Uh, national Park so that we all uh, could come join and visit. Um, on the left hand side there's the cabin. Um, I've, uh, I've tried twice to try to find this cabin. Uh, this cabin is now covered in, uh, in a pretty thick forest. Um, I've heard tell of a pile of, uh, of rocks uh, that are what's left of the chimney. Uh, but we still see today uh, people um, just uh, like uh, you and I coming up um, and standing at the face of, of glaciers with their camera um, and taking a couple of photos and then just gazing um, and in utter awe of the area all around it. Uh, the glacier that this uh, gentleman is standing at um, was actually named the Muir Glacier after uh, John Muir, uh, named by um, Eliza Skidmore, who uh, came up after reading letters written uh, by John Muir in the San Francisco uh, Bulletin. Uh, named that glacier um, after him. So this is an area now of explanation and exploration. Uh, today uh, we've got a couple of different photos here and we can um, actually see uh, that um, glaciers, uh, the several glaciers, uh, or most of the glaciers in Glacier Bay National Park um, have receded. The lower picture um, is of uh, at the moment a uh, Muir Glacier in 1941 um, has receded quite a ways um, all the way up um, to uh, 2004 uh, where um, there's uh, nothing left behind uh, but uh, a deep U-shaped valley um, called a fjord. Um, so incredibly uh, beautiful spot um, and a spot uh, that is uh, constantly in flux, a place that is constantly uh, changing and a place uh, that John Muir uh, loved very much. He came for the very last time in 1899, uh, joining the Harriman Expedition, a railroad tycoon uh, with uh, um, basically a badly under stress, decided he wanted to take a vacation, so he fashioned a boat, invited a bunch of uh, incredibly um, knowledgeable people at the time, including John Muir. Uh, they came up um, in 1899, his last visit for John Muir um, to the area, um, and uh, several months after he left, an earthquake um, caused that moraine in front of um, Muir Glacier, we think anyway, to slide off, exposing Muir Glacier um, to uh, the 
tidewater and filling the bay for um, years afterwards um, and, uh, um, and made it uh, inaccessible um, as the Muir Glacier uh, began to fall apart. Well, we also uh, want to take a look um, at the lens of Glacier Bay National Park as a living laboratory. It's more than just a place to visit, more than just a place to, to walk around, a place uh, to make you uh, feel um, maybe a little small sometimes, a place to see wildlife, but it's also for many people um, an area in which you're able um, to actually study the natural history of the area and learn more, not just about Glacier Bay National Park, uh, but also learn about uh, the, the world around us. Uh, this is a Mount Coober, um, uh, and it is just above Lamb Plu Glacier. Uh, so this was named after William S. Cooper, again, an ecologist who came to the area, um, and his um, forte uh, was studying not only coastal uh, um, ancient rainforests, but also plant succession. How do plants come back into an area after the glacier has wiped the slate clean? All right. Well, we talked about John Muir uh, coming uh, to Glacier Bay and uh, his uh, impetus for Glacier Bay not only being described, but also um, as uh, it's also being explained. Um, and so uh, we're moving into living laboratory. And I took a look at the website there at Glacier Bay National Park and the list of studies, uh, the list of, uh, of people and the list of, of uh, topics that people are studying in Glacier Bay is uh, very long. Um, and uh, very worth your tax dollars because uh, we are learning not only about uh, the Glacier Bay National Park area, uh, but about our world um, in general. Uh, this is a picture of uh, this photo here is of uh, uh, Mount Cooper, named after William X. X. S. Cooper, who was an ecologist. And one of the first studies um, that uh, was done in Glacier Bay was one um, that studied how plants come back into a region after a glacier has wiped the slate clean. Um, he um, staked out um, a three by three foot area right at the face of the glacier and re would revisit that area, um, cataloging the plants uh, that were there um, and how they actually came back. Well, this is important because uh, during the Wisconsin Ice Age about 20 million years ago or so, one third of North America was covered in ice. And so this happened in places like Wisconsin and uh, the Dakotas. Um, uh, all the places that are in the northern part of, uh, of the United States and Canada. So uh, let's talk about some of the things that are being studied here. Um, uh, first off, we're looking at plant succession. Uh, when a glacier recedes, uh, there's nothing left. There's no um, soil whatsoever. Uh, but as time goes by, the wind blows in uh, spores for lichen that land on the rocks and begin to grow, fixing nitrogen from the air. Um, uh, other plants uh, that are blown, uh, seeds are blown in uh, by the wind, uh, begin to take advantage of the accumulation of, uh, of lichen and moss, and they begin to take a foothold, they begin to take a root hold um, in areas um, right as the glacier begins to recede, building up the nitrogen in the soil. Uh, plants like dryas are, uh, will then uh, come in and coat that entire area, um, growing um, dying every year um, and creating uh, just a thin enough soil for um, other plants like uh, Sitka alder to come in uh, that fixes nitrogen from the air and drops its leaves every year, um, paving the way uh, for what you would find very far away from the glaciers, but uh, right down uh, where the glacier used to be at park headquarters, uh, where there are 200, 220 year old forests um, that were once uh, looked just like the glaciers um, that we just saw. Um, freshly deglaciated, uh, but now are covered in moss, uh, big Sitka spruce trees, um, and uh, incredibly beautiful uh, flowers as well. So plant succession, just one of the things uh, that they are being studied. Uh, there are also wildlife being studied there as well. Wildlife on a very small scale, these are ice worms. Uh, worms that actually live on glaciers, related to the earthworms. Um, they go through uh, pollen and soil that are blown onto the glaciers. Uh, they're maybe an inch uh, a long and very, very skinny, um, and you really have to look for them when you're up right next to the face of the glacier. So um, we're also looking at the underwater world. What's happening underwater? Uh, the second or third year that I worked at Glacier Bay, um, I met a bunch of researchers. They were actually divers, and they were diving down um, underwater in Glacier Bay National Park to catalog the plants and the animals that were there because 
Um, at one point, there were only about five sea otters in all of Glacier Bay about 15 or 20 years ago. Uh, now there are thousands of sea otters. So cataloging what the undersea world looked like uh, before these ravenous yet cute little creatures uh, came into the area um, is uh, a, a way, uh, once again, uh, to study change uh, in the area. Um, I put this one in here, especially, I'm not sure if she's still with us, uh, for Merith, because I know she loves birds, uh, um, but uh, studying uh, the uh, migratory bird species, um, using uh, the areas that uh, the glaciers have uh, uncovered. Um, off to our left there, uh, an American, uh, or black oyster catcher, I should say. And then uh, what I believe is a, a willow ptarmigan here, um, on the right, uh, one uh, foraging in the intertidal zone and the other one foraging um, uh, on uh, seeds and berries right at the face uh, of a glacier. Uh, boy, marine animals uh, are uh, no stranger to Glacier Bay National Park either. Um, it's one of the most protected places in the world for migrating humpback whales who come to southeast Alaska and uh, to the lower bay um, of Glacier Bay National Park uh, to find food. Um, the whale watching is not great here, only because uh, they are so protected, but just outside the park, um, whales have been coming to this area for generations. Um, these are humpback whales. Also, um, every year, right around my birthday, June 16th, um, a pod of transient orca, killer whales, would come into Glacier Bay National Park. And for a week uh, before and after my birthday, I had binoculars glued to my eyes every time we went up bay, because uh, um, uh, orca are very special to see. Um, and you never know, you might actually see one um, trying to find a bite to eat, which is nature, Discovery Channel stuff, right? Um, this is just outside of the cabin um, that I have in uh, Glacier Bay uh, National Park, um, just outside in Gustavus. And there's actually um, a cow uh, moose here, and then also a young one that you can see just behind her. Um, there's change happening here as well. Um, in the 60s and 70s, very, very few moose in the area, few of any moose in the area. Uh, by the time I got there in the late 90s and early 2000s, it was pretty dangerous just to ride your bike down the road because so many moose had moved into the area and had found a tremendous amount of willow, a tremendous amount of food to eat, and their population skyrocketed. Well, along with that, uh, bears, uh, brown bears and black bears um, have uh, followed uh, their prey species uh, um, and are in flux. When I was first in Glacier Bay, uh, there was almost a line you could draw in the bay where brown bears were above that line and black bears were below that line. Well, that line has been sufficiently blurred now as brown bears have begun to move south uh, following um, the abundance of, uh, of game uh, species that um, have also uh, moved south along the way. Uh, they're also studying wildlife, not just the wildlife uh, that's on, uh, that uh, calls Glacier Bay home, but also um, uh, tourism and uh, how uh, people who come into the park affect uh, the wildlife and the landscape around them. Uh, so uh, many studies uh, going on about uh, not only um, how humans interact with the wildlife and the land around them, uh, but also um, change over time uh, with uh, bears um, and, uh, and whales, uh, plants, and, um, uh, and sea otters are especially um, uh, high points uh, for study. Well, uh, I, I think because uh, we've got a, we had a little bit of a, a stoppage there, I'm just going to move on with the questions. Uh, one of the things I really miss about being in Glacier Bay are the sunsets. They don't happen too often uh, that you get a nice clear day, but when you do, uh, boy, it's, uh, it's pretty, pretty uh, darn special. Um, so uh, just to, to recap here, um, Glacier Bay is special for many, many reasons. Um, it's, uh, it's special because of tidewater glaciers. Um, it's special because we can actually visit those tidewater glaciers uh, from a boat or from a kayak. Um, it's incredibly special because the people who have called this area home for hundreds of years are still calling uh, this place home. Um, and the cast of characters uh, um, like uh, Captain Cook in Vancouver, uh, La Perouse and John Muir who come afterwards uh, for the change over time um, in uh, the animals. Uh, as well as for uh, remnants of temperate old growth coastal uh, rainforest. But really, um, it is all about uh, the glaciers. Uh, that is uh, the gem of, uh, of Southeast Alaska. It's uh, also uh, the several gems uh, that Glacier Bay National Park um, um, encompass. Uh, this is a spot uh, shot from uh, Johns Hopkins Inlet um, and uh, ice uh, stranded uh, behind it. Well, 
20 years ago, I came to Glacier Bay National Park um, and it changed my life. Um, uh, I, uh, we are living in a time of uh, tremendous change. And uh, one of the things that Glacier Bay National Park has taught me is that uh, the, really the only constant in life is change. And by watching this place over the last uh, 20 years, um, uh, it has become very apparent to me that um, our, best, uh, um, our best course uh, is to watch this change happen, uh, to adapt, uh, to roll with it, uh, and to come back, um, much like the plants and animals have um, in Glacier Bay uh, National Park. So um, I sure hope uh, that we are able to make it back there uh, soon. Um, I miss it uh, terribly. Um, and uh, going through all of these photos uh, really brought me uh, back uh, to the last 20 years of reflecting um, in Glacier Bay National Park and uh, the power and importance of change as well. Um, all right, well, that's what I have for you. It looked like, um, looked like Marjorie had a question. She raised her hand. Um, Marjorie, can okay, you check that? I think, uh, I think you're muted, Marjorie, but I think on the bottom left-hand side, if you move your cursor down there, you can change your mute to unmute. Go ahead. Okay, how's there that? Go. All right, oh. I hear you, Marjorie. Hi, how are you? Good, thank you so much. This is wonderful. Oh, my pleasure, my pleasure. It's, uh, if you, you gotta still travel. Sometimes you do it with your feet, sometimes you do it in your head. <laughs> Well, we're back in West. Great place to go. <laughs> oh wow! All right, quite a ways away from Glacier Bay, but I saw uh, many uh, photos. Uh, the bears are up and about, and um, and uh, and running around. Um, uh, many tracks and scats uh, uh, was seen. Um, Sean, who was on here a little bit earlier, uh, posted some photos. Uh, he lives in Gus Davis, a uh, little town just outside south of Glacier Bay National Park, and. Um, he had some uh, great uh, photos um, and some uh, um, stories about hearing the birds uh, starting to return back to the area, especially uh, buried thrush, which is always a sign of spring. So spring is beginning uh, to, uh, to, to, uh, to come into, into fruition um, there um, in Glacier Bay National Park. And uh, I would imagine that uh, many of the animals are starting to, to come out of hibernation and make their presence known as well. Well, Sean, you're welcome to take yourself off mute if you want to. Um, he says he saw, his wife saw two whales yesterday. Oh, great, yeah. Sean's uh, wife uh, studies uh, whales in uh, Glacier Bay National Park. So um, um, I've read a lot of her writings and, and uh, um, uh, I paraphrased her a lot <laughs> when I'm talking about whales. That's great, the whales have arrived, that's awesome. Amy and Bob say uh, they cru they cruised with Alice in Glacier Bay two years ago. Is she still with Uncruise? And how's she doing? Alice. <laughs> yeah, Alice is a Clinket guide. She doesn't work for Uncruise, but she this is Sean uh, in Gustavus. And uh, she's still in Huna, but she is no longer uh, working for as a guide. I think uh, I think she's about almost 80 now, but uh, she's quite a uh, ambitious 80 year old, but she's no longer guiding. I think I do know Alex from many, many moons ago, but uh, not from the uh, cruise. Yeah. Uh, as you, uh, you might uh, find out that uh, there's um, a group of people that uh, tend uh, to uh, make their way back uh, to Glacier Bay year after year. Uh, some folks stay and make their home, uh, some folks uh, come uh, seasonally, but it is uh, a place whether you uh, are working as a guide or decide to, to stay or work for the park service, um, it's a place that really grabs a lot of folks and uh, um, is a big reason why we have a lot of uh, crew uh, returning to our boats anyway um, to come back and, and get a chance to experience uh, these places and, uh, and, and show you uh, them as well, to share them with you. So Jeremy, I have a question. You said something about the, that you don't often see orcas in Glacier Bay. What, um, so I've been I've been with Uncruise there twice, and this the, actually the second time we did see a pod of orcas, and I I think it was in early August. Um, but I now I'm realizing that we were really lucky. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, you are. Uh, hi, Debbie. How are you? Good. Um, yeah, um, orca are um, well, in the height of the, the whale season when the humpback whales have um, gathered in southeast Alaska and, and around Glacier Bay. Um, there are certain places that uh, many folks on boats can talk to each other and uh, and you can go and find uh, humpback whales. But, um, but orca uh, tend to travel um, very long distances and they often do that um, pretty quickly. They might hang out in an area for a couple of days, but they're not as regular um, as uh, you might find a humpback whale. So um, yeah, it was very lucky to see um, orca. Some years we see them um, more often uh, than not. Uh, but if we do see them or we hear they're around, uh, we generally alter our course um, and alter our plans so that we can try to be and share some space uh, with them. So, um, yeah, lucky you uh, to see them when you're uh, when you're up there. And uh, let me know the next time you're coming up so I can be on your boat. Uh, so maybe we can see them together. Wonderful. I don't have any other questions right now. We'll give it a couple more moments. Um, but we will try to get this up for people if they'd like to re-see it or share as soon as possible. So just keep checking back to our social media for that. So thank you very much for doing this for us. It was, uh, it was, it was nice. To, it's nice to see our, some of our shipmates. I was just noticing, um, I don't know if you remember, Jeremy, but there was a small group of us and there was a he Heather and Mel and Peg and Dan and they were they were scattered on this and so it was kind of fun to to see everybody because I know Heather's Heather is a nurse at UC Davis Medical Center and she's in the middle of it so oh all right uh, she is a uh, she's right by me then actually I'm in uh, Northern California at the moment as well uh, yeah. it is, uh, it was a, thank you for coming um, it's a you know, um, a strange time uh, right now, but to, to be able to delve through all of these photos um, and uh, and revisit a, a place uh, that I love, but I'm far away from, and also to see um, people that I've met uh, over the years and uh, shared uh, weeks with and, and incredibly special experiences in uh, wild places with um, also makes my heart sing. So thank you for, uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for uh, joining and, and uh, why we hope to see you again uh at, at some point in the future um on a boat and uh sipping coffee uh while uh, uh watching the wildness of the southeast alaska go by thank you you bet my pleasure Debbie. good to see you wonderful okay i'm gonna go ahead and close out have a good evening everyone okay i'm gonna special shout out to captain deb and uh, sean uh thank you guys um feedback is good um, but, uh, um, but it's so great to see your faces and, and, um, yeah, hope you're well, stay well, stay, stay healthy out there.